Good evening. It is good to be back in Columbus. I wanted to know that we had a wonderful time this morning in um, Enterprise. It was like going home again. We appreciate so much their love for us and the opportunity just to go back once in a while to see how they are doing. And while we were there, of course, we were tuned in to Casino Road and noticed with pleasure the addition of another soul to the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for her growth and her development in Christ. In the past few weeks, if not months, we have been noticing some of the parables of Jesus. This evening we want to take a look at Luke chapter 8 verse 11 and 1 Peter 1 23. Luke chapter 8 verse 11, Luke's account of the parable of the sower. Verse 11 of Luke chapter 8, it simply states, now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Most people expect God's Word to work like a stick of dynamite. But we know that because of what Jesus said, the Word is like a seed. The Holy Spirit through Peter also said, God's word is a seed in 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So God's word, according to this text, the seed is alive. Now, if the seed is alive in me, then I have to be alive with the seed. And if the seed is alive in me, then the seed will grow and produce. But if, as a Christian, there is no produce, then there is no seed. Something went wrong. Therefore, they, they can, uh, the word that is supposed to be in me does not produce as a seed should because that word is not living and active. Something has gone wrong. In John chapter 6 and verse 63, Jesus tells us, it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The word that I speak, they are spirit. And listen to the next one. They are life. Now, Jesus said his words are alive. They contain life. The words in your Bible may look lifeless and powerful, seeds do too. But they are not without life. Our power. So I've got to do something. In Mark chapter 4, verses 30 and 31, Jesus explained that the kingdom of God works like a seed. So if we are to understand God's kingdom and how he operates, then we need to understand seeds. Look with me at Mark 4, 30 and 31. And he said, Whereunto shall we lighten the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, 
when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. It is so small, so tiny. Yet when it is planted, it produces a tree. Let's talk about seeds for a minute. A seed is alive. It contains life. Now, your physical senses are incapable of judging whether a seed is alive or not. You cannot see, you cannot feel, you cannot hear, you cannot smell or taste the life in a seed. There is only one way to prove a seed is alive. Plant it. That's the only way to prove it. A seed does nothing unless it is planted. Seeds do not grow sitting in, in, in a sack on your shelf. They must be planted in the proper place. Now, if you desire the Word of God to produce in your life, you must desire to plant the Word of God in your heart and in your mind. The best way then to plant the seed of God's Word in your life is by speaking the Word. Hearing others speak the word is good, but will not produce as bountiful a harvest as you speak in the word of God yourself. Romans 10 and 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Now what he says? And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So there has to be a speaking. There has to be a teaching. The word of God must be taught by me if it is to produce. Now, whatever you need to be saved or delivered from, confession is essential. One has to go to the, th the 53rd Psalm or rather 51st Psalm, and listen to David. Remember there's a whole year in his life that he said nothing. He did nothing. He let the word of God stay in him. He knew what was right, but because of his own shame, he said nothing until the prophet came to him and let him know what he had done. And then David says some lofty words in the 51st 50, Psalm. Creating me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. And later on he will say, Then will I teach transgressors thy words. Something was missing in his life. The word was a dead seed in him until he began to put his life together and then began to teach others then we see the seed begin to grow. And remember this, a seed is much smaller than the plant it produces. Listen, a seed is much smaller than the plant it produces. What about your life? Is it alive because of the seed in you? What is the seed doing? Is it growing you to the point where others will grow because of you? Listen. The problem you face may seem large or huge. In comparison, a scripture may seem very small, but when planted, that word will grow in you and overcome the problem. There is no problem that you can face that God has not already dealt with. In other words, you cannot produce something that the word of God has not dealt with. Therefore, the only reason why we are not successful is because we have not allowed the Word of God to work through us. 
Sometimes we got too many problems. And those problems are only there because we don't allow the seed to germinate and produce. You see, God is not going to remove that problem for the most part. But when the seed grows, it's going to overshadow that problem. As we read back in Matthew 13, there are all kinds of different souls. There are those with thorns growing up around them. And sometimes when you pull up the thorns, it can also pull up the seed. But the seed, the good seed, can overcome those thorns. But we have to allow the seed to go to work. And listen, a seed always produces after its kind. Galatians 6 and verse 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's a fact. Whatever you need or desire, find scriptures relating to that. That plan those scriptures and then plant those scriptures inside of you in abundance. Those seeds will grow up and produce a harvest of what you need or desire. A seed is powerful. I think we know that. As a seed begins to grow, it will push up dirt and rocks, etc. Whatever the obstacles are, God's word planted in your hearts will push them out of the way. Don't you believe that? You better believe it if you're going to live successfully. That's how powerful God's word is. And the, the, Hebrew, letter, the Hebrew letter tells us in Hebrews 4 and verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, I like that word, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I like the word piercing. It goes so deep. Old Brother Kibo used to say, the word of God is so powerful, it cuts a going and a coming. And there's some truth, so that it is powerful if we allow that seed to be planted oh, but just a minute we must become the good soil we must allow the word of God to take root to germinate in us so that it can produce but oftentimes the word of God is crowded out by the so many things in our lives. We got so many things to think about and we are not thinking about the word of God. We have every reason in our minds that is to worry about this, to worry about that, to worry about everything else. Listen, it happens. This past few days, even at, at, at our home, <laughs> I think it was Thursday, water heater gave out. I said, honey, don't worry, be all right. Friday, after we got the guy to come Friday, something else happened. So we get to feel water at, at, on the floor in the kitchen. Where is it coming from? We find and found out that the washer Seemingly, the drain has collapsed under the ground. All things are happening. What am I supposed to do? Sit and cry and rip my hand? No! My wife says, that's the reason we have rainy days, savings. I said, thank you, honey, for without you, there wouldn't be any rainy day for me. <laughs> oh, yes, she, had to, she always said, remember, rainy days. Put aside for rainy days. Thank God that we did that. It's amazing what can go wrong in just a minute. And if the word of God doesn't take hold of you, you will go to pieces. That's why you need the word of God. 
That's why you need to let the seed get down deep down into you. Make your soul good soul. Remember, it is not God that is, that is making the soil. God is producing the seed. And it's up to us to sow the seed as farmers. And it's up to you to, to put your heart or make your heart pliable so the seed can find root. Understand? And the only thing that softens our hearts is the word of God. You think of Lydia. Whose heart the Lord opened when? When the seed was sown. Back to um, Exodus and we read of Pharaoh. He hardened his heart because he would not accept the word of God from Moses. That's what happens. We harden our own hearts. And sometimes God make it possible that we get the same message so that we harden our hearts the more. But sometimes God has to knock us down and out. So when something bad happens in your family, don't start crying. Start saying, thank you Jesus, because without that bad stuff, you would not return to God. Sometimes we need some stuff to knock us out. Remember what God did to Saul of Tarsus? Knock him off his horse, made him blind for three days, make him have to depend upon someone to lead him around when he was accustomed to leading others. Only then he would say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? You have to come to that part in your life where you're humbly enough to say, God, I need you now more than ever. And stay with him. So we need, to, we need to make our hearts pliable so God's word can find a place and lodge there and bring forth fruit in good time. A seed begins its growth in secret or underground. Do you know what happens underground? I don't know. I just follow the law of planting. I get the seed, I dig the ground, drop it in, cover it over, and let God go to work. Let God go to work. And he does just that. The only way to tell if, if a seed is growing is to dig it up or wait for a plant to appear. It, if you dig up a seed, you may kill it. So let it grow. A seed takes time to produce. In our times when we want everything right there and then. That's why you have so many criminals. They want everything now without having to work for it, so they take it from somebody. Only to realize that freedom only lasts for so long because somebody is looking for them. And one of these days they're going to be caught. Because it seems like there is no one as wise as a criminal and no one as foolish as a criminal. He's wise enough to know what you have done and how to make you look small, but he is dumb enough to expose himself every time. Listen, no one expects a seed to produce a harvest the same day it is planted. Sometimes the word of God seems to spring up and bear fruit immediately. Yet if we knew the details, we would understand that the fruit of the word grew in that person's life over time. It takes time sometimes, doesn't it? Next, the seed is persistent. A seed is persi persistent. A seed never gives up but works day and night. Even when you are sleeping, the seed you are planting is working to grow and express itself in a fruitful harvest. Amen. Don't you sometimes want to go and take a peek? You go to sleep at night, so you get up in the morning and want to see what happened overnight. So every day you go to see if it burst open the earth and it, sprang, and it springs up. Why is that so? You don't know what happens, but you just want to see that it is growing. 
Next, a seed is not affected by other seeds. A seed is not affected by other seeds. Whatever happens to other seeds does not make any difference to a special seed. Each seed sticks to its own task. One wheat seed planted in a cornfield will produce wheat. Seed does not become discouraged or quit even if other seeds die. <laughs> Remember, but sometimes the planters refuse to do their work in tilling the ground, fertilizing the ground so that it can produce seed. Uh, it can produce um, fruits or vegetables based on the seed that is sown. Listen, a seed will stop, will stop growing without nourishment. It will stop growing without nourishment. Planting a seed is not enough to assure a harvest. Seed must be protected and taken care of until harvest time. It is too many of you grew up in cities. We grew up in the country where every boy, every boy had his own little field. And he goes and he plants every single season. That's how you ate back in my days. There was not enough money to buy all the produce from someone else. You grew your own food. And every single day there are some things that you had to do. Number one, you get up early enough, you take your animals out to the garden, and the garden was five miles up, uh, away or more. Five miles or more up the rugged, the, 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 the rugged terrain. There is no, no automobile to drive. Sometimes not even the donkey can go there. You have to walk on our foes to get there. Then you have to take your machete or your hose, and then you have to, you have to clean the, the field, and then dig rows in order for you to plant, and you plant your stuff. And then you still have to go every day, and as soon as any piece of wheat comes up, you pull it out. But you also have to fertilize it. If you ever were have uh, you ever heard of the 4-H clubs? That's what we learn, where we learn to do a lot of stuff. But it was important for us. I saw recently someone was asking a question, should we reintroduce agriculture in the local schools, in elementary schools? I say yes. Our kids are too lazy. They want to stay in bed all day long when there's no school. And when there's school, they still want to sleep late. They need to work hard. Nothing good comes easy. And the harder you work, the more you feel like you have accomplished something. Work is good, it's honorable, it's wonderful. You learn to sweat and you go and you get back home in the evening and you say, oh, they feel so good because you have accomplished a day's work. I have said this and I'll say it again. Too many of us work for money and not for the love of working. The money will go further if we love to work. If we just work for the money, it will soon be gone. You hear me? Try it and see. See those who just work for the money. For that matter, the money is gone before it's ever made. Because you heard of credit cards, and you heard of uh, calling somebody and saying, uh, please give me my money in advance not realizing it's going to cost you a lot more than you make. I'm just trying to teach you something. Don't you get into the habit of getting paid early before you work for it. You will end up broke. 
What was I saying? I forgot. But we want to get us to understand, you really want to appreciate your produce, work hard to get it done yourself and see what happens. When it comes, you want to sit by your table, eat your lettuce and your cabbage and your peppers, and you, when somebody comes to visit and you, and, and you invite them to your table, you say, I planted that. Can you begin to see the pride? You can feel it. I planted that it came from my garden. The same is true when you planted the word of God into somebody's heart and that person turns and comes to Christ. You, they, there's someone of pride in you who say, I am partly responsible for this person's conversion. It's a pride that is not a bad pride, but it's a good pride. It makes you want to work harder and work more. And finally, more seeds planted produce a larger harvest. More seeds planted produce a larger harvest. Second Corinthians chapter nine and verse six. Paul said, but this I say, he who soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. You know, we, we look at money every time we say this, but it goes beyond money. It's about everything. The more you plant, the more you produce. You understand? It is also true that the more you give, the more God blesses you. My wife and I have had many occasions to cry. We have had many occasions to cry. I don't mean just to, just to shed tears because something sad. No, because how we see God is blessing us. Every time it happens, it is a surprise to us that someone just decided to bless us. And we say we thank God. Because this is because of God. The more you sow, you cannot give enough to outgive God's giving to you. You hear me? God has a way of doing stuff. I'm so glad He's in charge of that. In another translation, it says, Remember this the farmer who plants a few seeds will have a very small harvest. But the farmer who plants because he has received God's blessings will receive a harvest of God's blessings in return. And here is where Luke 6 38 really comes in. Let me see if I have the right one. This is where it really comes in handy. Uh, let me see. Yes, it is Luke 6, 38. Listen to this verse. Because we always apply this to money only, but no, to me it goes beyond that. Listen to what Christ says. Give. Whatever it is you give, whether it's forgiveness or money, or whatever it is, give, he says, and it shall be given unto you. And then he says, good measure, good measure, press down together, whatever it is you're given, whether it's blessing somebody, whether it's money or forgiveness, whatever it is, give it. Out of the goodness of your heart. And you'll be amazed of how God returns, what God returns to you. Then he says, press down. Look it like that. Shake it together. Run it over. Shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that he meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You see, but sometimes we place limitations. 
I can't give him because he's making too much already. That's why you can't be blessed. You hold what you get, and it's not a blessing to you. And someday your children are going to show you it's not a blessing because they're going to take it and use it sometime right in front of your face and nothing you can do because you always have some kind of limitation to give it. When somebody has this, I can't do that. That's stupidity. Good measure. It doesn't matter what the person has. It matters what you decide to give. Good measure, press down together. Let's use love. Love. Mm -mm -mm. You know what love is, right? Let me put it this way, then we'll close. And I say this all the time. When we came to Columbus, we came where about six of us came in our family. When we leave, if we leave Columbus voluntarily, or the elders decide to let me leave, I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna love you. I'm only gonna take my wife and my grandchildren and leave my son and his wife for you. That's how much I love you. I'll just take my grandchildren and my wife and we'll go and leave you the blessings of my son and his wife. In that love? Amen, amen, amen. Think on these truths about seeds. Allow the Holy Spirit to help you apply them to the role of God's word in your life. Remember, it is seed. Don't allow anything to crowd out that seed so that it cannot do its work properly. Let us take God's word, let it work in us and produce after its kind, and produce more than we planted. It helps. You're here this evening. We want to invite you to let God's word come into your life. Obey it. Believe in Christ as the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ and be baptized. He'll wash your sins away. He'll make you new. He'll come in to live with you and you with him. Remember he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. He invites you to open your hearts, though. As a Christian, we need to make some changes in our lives. Now is the best time. We extend God's invitation. If you're subject, why don't you come as together we stand and sing. I know it was the blood, and I know it was the blood. Well, I know it was the blood that saved me. Hallelujah. One day when I was lost, my Jesus, he died up on the cross, and I know it was the blood. Say me, but he never said a mumbling word. But he never said a mumbling word, and he never said a mumbling word. And that saved me. Hallelujah! One day. Say